can it be perhaps that this influences orangutans? And if they have these periods in which there is very little food around and they have to eat all this bark and their energy budgets go negative, could it be that their mortality in those circumstances is higher? Because in some cases, uh, they might be susceptible to diseases more than when there's a lot of food around. Their immuno, immuno systems might be compromised. Um, unfortunately, we do not have the data to test this because the only place where we have reasonable mortality data from is from Sumatra, and we do not have those data from Borneo because it would take about it would take 35 years to collect those data because you have a very small sample size in numbers of orangutans, and uh, they live very long, they can live up to 55 or 60, so before they die and before you have an estimate of their survival, you need to be able to follow them for a long time. And on top of that, um, sometimes Indonesia is not as stable as you want it to be, so you might have to leave your study site, which means you lose a lot of data, which means whatever data set you were building up is not complete anymore, and when you return and you do not recognize your individuals anymore, you have to start from scratch again. So we're, we're, not, we're not sure about this, but this is what we think at least. Because if that would be the case, you would have an area where you would have a high food availability, starvation would be low, you would have a stable diet, you would have a low percentage of bark in the diet, and you would have a slow life history. And a slow life history is nice because it gives you time to grow larger brains. And larger brains might, might be good for certain things. Um, where starvation uh, might be intermediate, where there's intermediate food, you get an intermediate life uh, history pace. And where starvation is high, you really have to speed up to reproduce before they can't do that anymore. And this is at least what we think, and uh, maybe in 20 years we'll be really able to, to test this. But we think based on work with the other species, this might really be the key to this somewhat of a paradox that with higher food availability, you actually see development being uh, slower. So this is sort of the overall uh, summary that the differences between the subspecies can be mainly explained by fruit availability that influences all these factors. It influences mortality and that influences these factors. This is a somewhat simplistic overview, but we think these are the main. Uh, this is the main sort of process that is is uh, taking place. Now, there are a lot more differences. There are differences in culture. There are differences in, in other behaviors, in, in foraging techniques, uh, and all that means that. It, it makes it more difficult to, for us to actually define what an, what an orangutan is because they're, very, uh, they're a species with a lot of variation in there. And that means that when orangutans were living in the Pleistocene over this whole area, there might have been much more variation even than, than we find today in, in the areas that we find them today. And it also means that with all the forest loss that we uh, face today, that we're slowly uh, losing this variation. So we're losing sort of part of what it, of what orangutans are, because like with humans, it's it's very hard to define what all the variation in humans, how that, that constitutes the human species. With orangutans, there's maybe less variation, but there is substantial variation around, and, and, and that really defines for me what an orangutan is. It's not just the orangutans on Borneo, or just those on Sumatra, it's, it's all of them in all the populations. And for conservation, it's obviously a, a huge task to try to conserve that variation, and it also poses a great challenge for conservationists, because how, we, if if funds are limited, how do you choose which population are you going to try to, to conserve? Is it the population 
uh, that might have this certain behavior or the population might have a little bit of a different diet and that population how do you how do you make those those choices and these are not only difficulties for people that are trying to preserve orangutans but they're more and more becoming issues for people that study chimpanzees as well because as we all know chimpanzees have a very extensive uh, culture and and then how do you make your decisions and we're trying hard to to make the right decisions as a conservation community to conserve that variation, but it, it's, it's really uh, difficult. Uh, on top of it, this variation uh, gives us, in, in, in a way, maybe a bit of, of hope, in, which is maybe something of a contradiction, but uh, all of this variation in orangutans, and especially the fact that orangutans on, on Borneo seem to be able to cope better with low fruit availability and with eating leaves and barks means that they seem more robust to the effects of logging. If you look at forests on, uh, in, in, in Borneo, and this is just a schematic representation of, of data, you see that when, when logging starts, their density drops, and it probably will slowly come back if you let the forest recover and gets into a, a fairly stable density again when the forest uh, has been drawn back. On Sumatra, however, you see a huge drop uh, in density when, the, when there's extensive logging. And it will probably take a lot longer time for Sumatra and things to bounce back in those areas. So that means that um, when you're thinking about conservation of orangutans, you also have to take this variation into account. It might mean that when people are thinking about reduced impact logging and areas where you can try to mix uh, timber harvest with conservation, that there's more options available on Borneo to do so than, than on Sumatra. So it, it, it's at least for now indicating to us that on Borneo uh, we have to focus on primary forest for sure, but we also need to be sure that we try to preserve some of the forests that have been logged but not too heavily and where you still find orangutans. On Sumatra it means we really, really need to focus on the little bit of primary forest that is left. And that's a good indicator. I think it's a good lesson for, for me at least that when you understand more about the biology of a species, you can sort of model your conservation strategies based on, based on that knowledge. And that's what I think is a very good interface of doing more basic research where it can become applied research. And that's uh, the end of my talk. Okay.